Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to the History Squad. Now, today's video is all about repairing wounds and surviving pain and surgery, that kind of thing, in the ancient world. Now, I actually started looking at repairing wounds, surviving pain and surgery in the medieval times, but it kept dragging me back. And we've now gone 4,000 years BC. It's amazing the amount of knowledge that I've uncovered and the realisation that all of this knowledge from the ancient world on pain relief and surgery was actually lost for much of the medieval period. Now, I've got a couple of uh, demonstrations that we'll go through, uh, which can be a little bit bloody, so a bit of a warning there. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. So to begin with, we go way back into the ancient times to the Sumerians, 4000 to 2000 BC. They lived in what's called modern day Iraq, Mesopotamia in the old days. Now, the reason we know about them is because they had a form of writing, cuneiform, and, and also stellas. Now, the cuneiform is a clay tablet where they've recorded in their form of writing. The stellas were slightly larger, so you could get uh, more information and pictorial things on there too. And it's in clay tablets that have survived to this day, which give us a bit of a record of some of their medical practices. Now, we do understand that their king was responsible for clothing, equipping and feeding his army, but also for uh, the medical procedures, so I understand, for their army. Now, there was a lot of priests and incantations and magical things that were spouted off all around the medical services of the Sumerians. But we do know that they had a knowledge of hygiene and contagion. Now, I'm going to read you an interpretation of one of the cuneiform tablets from a doctor with regards to a woman who is contagious. And I think it's absolutely brilliant. So this is what the doctor says. I now give strict orders. Make sure that nobody drinks of the cup from which she drinks. So this is about a woman who's obviously got an illness, a disease. No one sits on the chair on which she sits and that no one sleeps on the bed upon which she sleeps. She should not gather many women about herself. So all of those thousands of years ago, there's a doctor who knows that you've got this woman and she has a contagion. So don't mix, don't, you know, take from their cup and all of that. They had no idea about bacteria, but they knew that she was contagious. Now, if you had a wound, for instance, we know that they had the three protocols. And the first one was, you've got a wounded guy, wash the wound, wash it clean. We know they used a mixture of hot water and beer to wash the wounds, which I understand from modern medics is a pretty good idea. So you wash the wound, you then use a poultice to actually place upon the wound, and then you bandage it. That's the three protocols, but you don't bandage it too tight. And then you go on to their prescriptions. And one of the things I found was a prescription treating venereal disease. So is this one of the first attempts at curing venereal disease? This is quite incredible. And because they wrote so many things down, we have a little bit of the, a history of their medical procedures because they did amass a phenomenal amount of knowledge. It's quite incredible. Now, following my path of research, we go from the Sumerian to the Egyptian period, 3,500 BC to 350 years BC. What a civilization. And of course, we know so much through their hieroglyphs and their papyrus, all of that kind of thing. We do know that their priest Physicians, yeah, were high status, looked after the royal families and the upper class, but they also had ordinary physicians, ordinary doctors, if you like. These were known as the Sunu. They were regarded as quite low caste from what I can understand, and yet these men were intelligent and they could read and write. They could end up working in, for the state, for instance. They could be employed on a building site or with the army. Now, with the army, they could go to the front line and serve as basically as combat medics, combat uh, doctors, from what I can tell. Or they could be back at base at the military hospital. These guys were quite clever. And one thing I've picked up, because I had uh, surgery done on my ankle, I broke it when I was a soldier, and it had to be set in a certain position, and they had to do it under a general anaesthetic, and I'll tell you, it hurt. 
what they come up with was the way of splinting a fractured limb. And it's, it's quite, I never thought about it until I, I read about these, these Egyptians. The contour of the body, you've broke your, your wrist or you've broken a bone here. You need to set it to the shape, don't you? So instead of having a straight splint and oh, forcing the wound against it, they came up with the idea of softened bark or even bundles of reeds that they would then stiffen to the shape, to the contour of the body. Now, once that is in place, they would then bandage. And you've only got to look at Egyptian mummies to know how good they were at bandaging. So, as you can see, I would never have made an Egyptian priest. As you bind him around, all the way done, and then they soak this in some form of resin or gum. Now, I do know that the resin they use for the mummies, for instance, which has got to be the same kind of thing, was called mummia, and that's where we get the word for mummy. Right, so the splint, it's in the contour of the body, the correct shape, it will be comfortable. But if you've got a boil or something or an abscess that needs to be lanced, you would need a, some kind of scalpel. Now they had bronze, um, copper. Also, they had apparently disposable scalpels, which were made from sharpened reeds. And I thought at first, oh yeah, but I've actually cut my finger on a reed growing strong so they are sharp but they had the iron scalpel so here we have a replica and it has been sharpened now i've already made a little hole in here but i'm gonna push this a little bit further just to see how sharp it is so it's in the wound i've already made and if i cut down wow that slices through this model absolutely no problems at all it works the famous Edwin Smith Papyrus of 1600 BC contains what is said to be the first treatise of medical trauma. It's basically a case file full of cases on how to treat the different wounds. Head trauma is one of the big things that goes there. It's interesting because it tells you how to feel for the pulse in the brain, how to examine the dura, but it warns also not to mistake a non depressed fracture to a depressed fracture on the skull. Apparently, there's a warning about this in modern textbooks, but let me just show you one or two things I've picked up from this papyrus. First of all, one of the main injuries, apparently, in the Egyptian army was being belted over the head with a mace. Now, I don't have an Egyptian mace. This is one of my old trusty truncheons from when I was a police officer. So this guy's been hit, smacked over the head. He's got a depressed fracture. We've identified it. We know exactly what it is. They had the ability to lift. Oh, I think I just killed him, actually. They had the ability to lift the bone and then set it with complicated bandages which hey that's that's quite fantastic but the next bit actually blows my mind let's just get rid of this head now i must warn you now there's a bit of blood so here is my model it's not a real skull so there's the brain so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, case number six from the Smith Papyrus. I've got it here because it relates to this very wound. Case number six, examination. If thou examinest a man having a gaping wound in his head, penetrating to the bone, smashing his skull and rending open the brain of his skull, thou shouldst palpitate his wound. Examine it. A feeling for that pulse. And it says here that if it's fluttering and it's not quite going right, he says at that stage, you'll know if it's going to be worth treating. In other words, is the patient going to live or die? If you think he's going to live, thou should anoint the wound with grease. Thou shalt bind it with two strips upon it until thou knowest he has reached a decisive point. So it's the way they 
then treated a serious head wound. So we've decided the guy's going to live, the brain has settled down. Now I'm going to put the lid back on my model there. So there's no blood now, or just a little. So let's imagine the top of his brain or skull has been smashed. You've had to re remove a piece of the bone. So now we've got to heal it. So what they did was they got linen soaked in warm wine and rose oil, and they actually placed that against the dura, against the brain. But then for the, the dressing to go over this, they got linen balls, which were soaked in vinegar and oil. And then they put strips of silk or, or even hemp coming out of the wound and down and then bandaged over it uh, in these complicated ways they could bandage. The strips were to allow the wound to actually drain. When you're looking at, you know, 1,600 years before Christ, this is quite incredible to me. But now you read on and you find that they knew all about inflammation and on about a wound going bad, infection. So what they did, and it tells you how they would stitch up a wound, but the evidence comes from a mummy of exactly how they stitched a wound. Now, there are two graveyards that they discovered in Egypt, and they're both military graveyards, so I understand, from 2000 BC. One has 59 bodies and the other has 60. The one with the 59, they were the majority of them were head wounds, soldiers who'd been killed in battle. But the others were covered a multitude of injuries, obviously fatal because they were in the graveyard. But they showed us spear wounds. They showed us all of these different things from arrow wounds. And that leads me on to another part of the Egyptian uh, medical services. If you've got a great big spear stuck through your arm, they take it out. How do they stitch it up? These Egyptian physicians had a practical approach and pragmatic approach to medicine, especially in the military. And we know from archaeological evidence that wombs were sutured. They found a mummy that uh, apparently he died about 1100 BC. Now that's 500 years after the Smith papyrus. And they talk about this yidur, about this suturing. But we don't think it was actual complete suturing. Because of the archaeological evidence found on the mummy, it was more like a clamp. And I've now set up a wound, as you can see, a spear wound. And I'm going to show you how the Egyptians sutured a wound. So as you can see, we've got a nasty wound here. A spear has gone through. They detached the shaft and they're going to have to whittle it around to get him out. So they remove. Ooh, relief. That's going to hurt, isn't it? Then they're going to search for any foreign objects still stuck inside the wound. They're going to wash it. They're going to clean it. But then it's closing the wound up. And from the archaeological evidence from that mummy, what we know is they stuck thorns either side of the wound. Yeah, it's going to hurt, but you're already in agony, aren't you? Now, they would fix these all the way along on both sides and then they would actually close them together. But here's one that I prepared earlier. You can see we've put in, let's use the spear point. I've put in the thorns. I've actually used cocktail sticks because I couldn't find any thorns big enough. But I do know from experience there are lots of thorns in the desert. So you put thorns through there. You then attach the linen thread either side, gather them together and... When you pull them, it simply draws the wound closed. Okay, so that's one we fastened. I'm going to pull the other one. And as you can see, it is actually closing the wound. But we haven't clamped it completely shut. It's just the edges are just about touching. This will allow the wound to drain, so they could either put a little bit of linen in it before they bandaged it. Now, when this is healed, they will remove the thorns, and then you will have just a nice little scar. 
this to me is, is, is quite incredible. So they were clamping the wound as opposed to actually fully suturing it. And what an eye opener. So you imagine the agony this guy's in. He's been in battle, he's been wounded, they've taken out the spearhead or the arrowhead, depending what you've been wounded with. They've then cleaned the wound, washed the wound, taken out any foreign objects from it. They've then done the yidr, they've stitched it all up. The guy's in agony as they dress it, but the Egyptians had 700 compounds and plants from which they could make their different remedies. So one of the ways of helping with the complete shock and agony of this was opium. The Egyptians from 1500 BC imported opium from the island of Cyprus, would you believe? Now, I've witnessed firsthand the effects of opium through modern day morphine. Um, I have witnessed somebody being shot and the agony the guy was in. Paramedics are on the scene in no time at all. They've given him some morphine and he has almost instantly relaxed his hay as they removed all the debris from his wound. So this guy now is, hey, yeah, no, it's great. But the infection, how did they fight the infection? One of their remedies is natural honey. Yes, the Egyptians had discovered that honey, it's a natural antibacterial treatment. You put it on the wound, cover it over, it will do its job. In fact, it was the best antibacterial treatment until the discovery of penicillin. But that's the modern age. We're talking 1500 BC here. To me, the Egyptians, amazing. So next, our research takes us to India, 400 to 100 years BC, and to a particular text, a writing called the Sushruta Samhita. And this is written by a doctor called Sushruta, who is regarded as the father of ancient Indian surgery and medicine. And it's quite incredible because this guy was an advocate of uh, dissecting human bodies. Now, if you were a, a student under him, you wouldn't go straight into cutting up cadavers' bodies. You would actually start on a piece of fruit or a vegetable, learning how to incise and excise, you know, so you're cutting things out. Uh, then you would uh, progress onto bags filled with mud of different consistencies so you can feel what's inside. Once you've completed that, onto cutting up the bodies of animals. And when you're ready, onto the human being, which this is quite fantastic because one of the things he really is quite stern about, he says, no wound should be suited, should be stitched until all morbid matter and pus has been removed. Now, this guy also had 15 separate ways written down of how to remove missiles from the body. So we're obviously talking military here. Uh, one of them includes the use of a magnet to draw iron fragments out of a wound. Now, once your, your wound has been cleaned and they then apply, would you believe, honey butter, exactly the same as the Egyptians did, as the antibacterial. But when they stitched it, they had specially made needles to do it just like this modern one here, so you can stitch through. They used silk, cotton, even horsehair as the thread. But if you're going inside the body and you, you've got some very delicate stitching to do, one of the ways he dealt with it was by getting large ants who've got the, the mandibles, is it called, and the big head, and they would get that to clamp on either side of the incision, and then they would snap the body off, leaving the head in place. And once that was all done, they would close up the wound and the body would then absorb the heads of the ants. From what I understand, this is the first recorded use of fully dissolvable sutures. Now, also, also contained within this um, writings in India is the first recorded use of the tourniquet. Now, the tourniquet wasn't used to stop bleeding so that you could then operate on it. That's gonna come later. This was for snake bites. Now, Alexander the Great, uh, 327, invaded the Indus Valley, but he found that his soldiers were often being bitten by snakes and his own surgeons had no idea how to combat this, how to save their lives. 
So he seizes Indian surgeons. So you can imagine what that means. Isn't it? You come here or you die. And they have to treat the wounds. And from what I can understand is this is how they did it. You've got a leather strap. You tighten it. This I'm doing quite old-fashioned way with a stick. So you're cutting off the blood supply. Here's the wound, my nice little snake bite there. They've fitted a tourniquet above the snake bite to stop the poison going up. And as they tighten the tourniquet really tight, it stops the blood flow. What happens then, apparently, is this will swell up with the poison. They will then cut it, incise it there, and all of that will then start to ooze out. Once that happens, they release the tourniquet and all the fresh blood flows down into the lower part of the leg, flushing the poison away. So it's, it's incredible when you think that um, these doctors, they knew how to treat, well, they got to, I suppose, because it's still quite a common cause of death in India, isn't it? Snake bite. So tourniquet used in India for snake bites. But it's interesting because in the writings, this Susruta Samhita, there is a whole section about uh, intestinal wounds, abdominal wounds, which are obviously military. And it talks about, you know, a guy's been slashed across the stomach and all his intestines are spilt out onto the floor. What do you do? So uh, what you do is you gather them all up and put them back in the hole. But if they're covered in mud or dirt, you've got to clean them. So they washed them in milk and then lubricated them in ghee, which is, is basically refined butter. Another thing was that uh, you have to check them out to make sure they're not damaged. And if there's any of them cut, you've actually got to stitch them before you put all of these coils back in. And it's quite a lengthy piece all about intestinal damage. Another thing the Sushruta Samhita covers is instruction on how to amputate limbs. And they even had a bit of an industry producing prosthetic limbs. So this is 400 BC, right out in India. They can put your intestines back and with a bit of luck, you might just survive. The way they sutured, the way they did all of these different things, but most importantly, the way they would actually give you a prosthetic limb if you'd lost your leg in combat. It's a bit wow, really. So now we're going back 2,500 years ago to ancient Greece. We're going to have a look at what an iatrus was. Actually, straight translation, it's extractor or arrowhead extractor. It means he was a physician. You see, the most important thing about ancient Greece is they had handwriting. They wrote everything down. So this makes the Greek writings on medicine the first records of Western medicine. And one of the things they talk about is prevent infection, wash the wound, bandaging the wound, suturing the wound, doing it all correctly. But this is all information that's taken from other civilizations. But what the Greeks have done, they've brought it together and they've written it down all in one place, which I think is Wow, because what I'm interested in is actual wounds, the military side of it and how they dealt with it. And in my little research into the Greeks, I found mention of a person, because it could be male or female, old or young, which is the wound sucker. So if you've got somebody who's been uh, with an arrow or a, a spear or a sword, whatever, and the wound is coagulating, they need to get in there to give it a good clean out. You snap your fingers and along comes the wound sucker. And <laughs> I don't think they would swallow the blood, but I spit it on the floor. It's, it's quite interesting the way I, I keep coming back to these various characters because the wound sucker I first learned about was in the medieval times. Now, something interesting to read is Homer's Iliad, the great poem, because it talks about soldiers being dragged, wounded soldiers, that is, being dragged from the battlefield. That'll be a bit inconvenient if you're fighting away and they suddenly drag you away unharmed, wasn't it? So let's do that. Wounded soldiers were dragged back from the battlefield, put on chariots, which then raced to the rear where you had physicians waiting for them. And they would give incantations, spells, songs, because that was half of Greek medicine was the, the religious, the, the magic side of it. 
He talks about a physician calming down a wounded soldier with wine. So straight away, we're going into this calm them down, sedate them a little bit, then wash the wound remove any arrowheads or anything like that. Now, the way they did that was they actually widened the wound so they could get into it, which I can understand. Once that was done, the wound would then be bandaged and the combatant will be sent off to the hospital. This whole business that it, it shows you that they're evacuating the wounded from the battlefield for treatment. And this is in the Iliad, the poem by Homer. So much of the writings of the Greeks is actually put down for medicine. But one thing that I've realized is if you were a surgeon or, or a, a physician in ancient Greece, you were really low status. And you had to travel around from town to town looking for paying patients to make a living. Interesting. So you can't mention ancient Greek medicine without mentioning Hippocrates and his 60 volumes on Greek medicine. I don't think he wrote them all. I think some of his associates wrote them with him. But contained within it is some really important information. For instance, your lowly physician. He could be hired to go on campaign with the army. And he was very, very important. Now, there weren't many of them. So we assume they were hired at the personal expense of their commanders. But one thing they were about was hygiene, where you set your camp, do it right. Now, there are very few recorded cases of epidemics and things happening on military campaigns for the Greeks, so they were obviously doing something right. Uh, one thing I find fascinating is your lowly physician there takes his family with him when he goes on campaign. But personal hygiene was also important. They had their goddess Hygieia. She was the daughter of the god of healing. She was the goddess of cleanliness. So all of this information gained within the 60 volumes also tells you of being wounded. If you have a soldier who's been wounded, yes, it tells you how to remove an arrowhead, widening the wound and all of that, but also how to deal with a dislocated shoulder, how to repair a broken leg. But where they come unstuck is if you've got a soldier who is bleeding. Now, they did have at one time a tourniquet. So they put the tourniquet on, they stopped the bleeding, but they didn't know what to do next because they didn't know or they hadn't invented the arterial clamp or they didn't know how to suture a blood vessel. This will come later in history. So as soon as they released the tourniquet, the poor soldier would bleed to death or if they didn't and they kept the tourniquet on, gangrene infection. So your poor Greek soldiers very often simply bled to death. So now we move on to one of my favourite periods in history, the Romans, 753 BC to 400 AD, approximately. But did you know that only a small percentage of Roman soldiers were actually recruited from Italy, and those were mainly kept in Italy, in Rome. The rest were from all over the empire. So you imagine how important within the Roman army hygiene was. So we're going to look at it from the first century AD. Hygiene was the key. Where you did your forts, where you built them, safe water, sewers, diet, inspections, daily inspections of your troops, you know, what, their living conditions, what are they like? Uh, and also things like uh, cremating the dead. You cremate them outside of the fort, spread the ashes away. Now, I used to do tours around Calian Roman Fort in South Wales. Now, it's got an amphitheatre, that's great, but I used to like taking the kids, the students, to the far end of the fort because there you could see how all of the fort was laid out. And most Roman forts were the same. So you could visit, you knew exactly where the latrines were. And the particular latrines at Calian are at the far corner, right on the outside now, you could sit down, you could do your poop, and you could use your sponge on a stick to wash your backside. And when there was enough effluent down inside those latrines, and it's a couple of meters down, they simply pulled a sluice gate and the whole lot was flushed out. And you can follow where it went 
under the walls of the garrison there of the fortress, right out into the field, away from the living conditions. This is, is, is fabulous. But the doctors of the Roman army, they were specially trained. You see, your civilian physicians, it was an ad hoc kind of training, a bit of an apprenticeship. But if you were a physician and you joined the army, you had to go through the army medical procedures. You also had to train as a soldier. You were one of them. Now, if you were the medicus, you'd qualified as the senior medical officer, you were attached to your commander's staff. So you were very, very important. It was your job to keep the troops safe. Their health was priority on your daily routine. So with regards to the medical services of these legions, there's, there's an individual character, he's called the Capsari, and the best image I've seen of him is on Trajan's column, a carving in, in Rome. What the Capsari was, was basically the equivalent, the ancient equivalent of your combat medic. He was dressed the same, armed the same as everybody else, right in the front line. So you imagine, you're a legionary, you're fighting away, your gladius is there, and all of a sudden, wallop, you get stabbed, down you go. The guy behind you, of course, steps over you to take your place. Now, I always thought that they would keep moving forward, the legion, and then you would be picked up afterwards. But no, the Capsari will be on you. He'll bandage your wound. He's trying to stop the bleeding. He will then drag you back. There, waiting just behind your unit, will be horses, wagon or chariot. These have been specially put by as part of the legion. You'll be placed on, let's say, a chariot. Then you gallop to the rear where there is a field hospital. This is so brilliant. You're then put on the table and the medical doctor, he can actually start to work on you. So you're on the table. You might have just woken up. The Capsaris dragged you all the way back. They open the bandage. There's blood everywhere. Now the Medicus, his job is to stop the bleeding. Straight away, tourniquet. Blood is stopped. You're in agony. So how about giving you some opium? Yeah, from the opium poppy. Or henbane, or the henbane seeds. These are a kind of an anaesthetic because they contain scopolamine which is still used today within pre-anesthetic drugs. So they're making you drowsy. They could have used white mandrake, which is a little bit dangerous though, because they could knock you out and not wake you up. That gives you a slight drowsiness, hallucinations, that kind of thing. So there's the surgeon. He stopped the bleeding. He's now calmed you down. He can now apply a surgical clamp, an arterial clamp. This is the Roman army. Wow, they clamp off that blood vessel. They can also tie them off and then they could suture them. This is quite incredible. I don't think they knocked you out completely. I don't think you were put under, shall we say, for surgery. That doesn't come about till 1846. But what the Romans were doing were they were looking after their wounded. Let's face it, a fully trained soldier, he's worth an awful lot of money. Do what you can do to save him. Much of what we know about the medical services of the ancient Roman legions comes from the writings of Cornelius Celsus. He was a top military surgeon and he, he wrote down so many things. But the one that I'm looking at here is about abdominal stab wounds. So you imagine you're in the front line there, you're fighting away and all of a sudden you are stabbed or slashed across the intestines. You drop to your knees, your intestines spill out, the man behind you steps over you. You might even step on your intestines. But straight away, the Capsari there, he bundles you onto a stretcher, drags you back to the chariot, and you're raced all the way back to the field hospital. When you're there, they knew what to do. I've got it all written down here. I'm going to read some parts of it because it talks about You've got to ascertain whether the intestines are the correct colour. Are they livid or pallid or are they black? In which case, check, is there any sensation there? Can they feel it? If not, put the patient to one side. Triage. He's dying. But if they're in good condition, you have to wash them with warm water. But if you can't get them back into the hole, 
you simply use, I've got a couple of uh, replicas here. These hooks hook on the side of the membrane and pull it open. You then push back in the intestines, but before you stitch, you must stitch first the membrane and then secondly, the outer layer of skin. So you double stitching. And the reason he says you've got to do that double stitching is because they are vulnerable with people who twist and turn. They could easily open up the wound. So from this extract, we know that salsus could treat an abdominal wound where the abdomen has been opened and there's a prolapsed in intestine. Now, not only that, he has introduced some of the basic principles that we still use to this day with regards to abdominal surgery. To me, that is just wow. But it's so sad. All of that surgical and medical knowledge that we have from the Romans was all lost with the collapse of the Roman Empire and that tide of barbarism that swept through Europe in the fifth century. That great legacy that was Rome was lost to the West. We didn't recover it for a thousand years. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, like, share and subscribe. And if you'd like to support the channel further, have a look at our Patreon community and community it is. We have a little bit of fun there. Now, the link is in the description. But before I go, a quick mention to three of our Patreon members. Thanks, guys. Dave Hagley, King Henry Beauclerk and Bob Tuscan. Thanks a million, guys. Bye for now.